it's about ideas and it's about letting the best idea win. Right. And it's about not taking, not making it personal and then hopefully not taking it personal. It's interesting. I've read somewhere that America is losing like $500 billion because of absenteeism, bad health. Even if the decision doesn't go our way, 99% of the people can actually fully buy into and support that decision. And so we help teams understand both backgrounds, personalities, and through those two things, it's amazing the trust that can be built in a very short amount of time when we really slow down and focus on those things. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce a very uh, old friend of mine. Unfortunately, we had a big gap in our relationship, but we worked intensively um, many years ago uh, when uh, John Maxwell uh, was in uh, former USSR countries. And at that time, David, please correct me if I, I'm, I'm wrong, that you were um, his president, president of Equip, I think. Uh actually of the John Maxwell company, but a sister uh, company. Sister company. Anyway, you were one of his top guns. And yep. uh, I know that most of the decisions which John was making regarding travel and participation in different uh, conferences and seminars was going through you. So, and, and then we started, you know, we, we met each other. But David Hoyt is now a principal uh, consultant at Table Group. And to my shame, I didn't know much about Table Group until recently. And now I've realized that it's really very interesting consulting company, which is using uh, as a platform for its consultancy works of Patrick Lencioni or Lencioni, uh, to pronounce it correctly. Uh, one of the top uh, American uh, trainers and consultants, I think, in organizational health, in management, um, and uh, in uh, team building. And you are his top gun now. And you are, your, your list of consulting companies also very impressive. It's more than my arm, I think. And uh, today, because I know that you're a very busy person, I would like us to talk about uh, the work and consultancy in the area of building a team. Yep. So what does it take to build a winning team? I don't know anyone uh, uh, who deals with uh, leadership who wouldn't be talking about that. You know, building a team, you know, et cetera, et cetera, from selection to actually, you know, growing within. But what I found that the work of uh, Patrick and your work uh, is touching upon very, very important fundamentals. And I think there are, if I'm not mistaken, five of them, five, mm -hmm. five dysfunctions. And the, I like the beginning that uh, the organizations are naturally dysfunctional and teams are naturally dysfunctional. Because we used right. to say that people, you know, get together. It's our natural desire to work together, but actually, no. And if you can tell us about these principles um, in maybe more depth, uh, I would appreciate that. And my, my listeners in the business area would also would like to hear that. Sure. Sounds great. Uh, well, Gennady, it's, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know it's much later over there um, with the, uh, the time change, but I've uh, been looking forward to this. So. Um, as a consulting company, our, our focus is around helping leaders master what we call four disciplines of organizational health. And, and I know on this um, virtual session, we're going to spend the majority of it on that very first discipline, and that is uh, building a cohesive leadership team. And so Pat has written a book uh, called Five Dysfunctions of a Team. As we meet with teams, I, I like to kind of flip it. One of my strengths is positivity. So I typically talk about uh, those five dysfunctions, really the flipping them to the five behaviors of cohesive teams. And I'll really quick run through the five and then we can drill down wherever and however you want. Um, but the first and the foundation, and nobody's ever shocked by the, the first behavior, and that's trust. Mm -hmm. Now, with trust, most people think of what we call predictive-based trust. And, and that's where you and I work together for uh, – any kind of period of time, you're presented with a decision or a set of circumstances, I probably can predict how you're going to handle that. And it, it is part of trust, but that's not really what we're talking about. Uh, well, predictability, in sort of behavior. Let's say that again. It's more like predictability. 
So yeah, make us feel right. comfortable, but not really trust. That's right. The word that we use with trust on teams is vulnerability based trust. Now, one of the things I know about the word vulnerability, that's not one of those neutral throwaway words, especially in organizational context. And as I work with leadership teams and, and I talk about uh, vulnerability based trust, you can just like see everybody tense up a little bit and where we're going. But what we mean by that, so what we what it doesn't necessarily mean is that to be vulnerable with my team, I'm off in the corner crying every meeting or something like that. What it does look like on teams is I can quickly and easily admit mistakes, weaknesses. I can ask for help. I can acknowledge when somebody's idea is better than my own. All those are signs that a team has uh, built or is building vulnerability-based trust, foundational. Um, second behavior is uh, healthy conflict. And while very few people are surprised that the foundation is trust, sometimes people hear conflict and they think, man, I thought, I thought we don't want to have conflict on teams. Right. Avoid it at any cost, yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. And we find truly the best teams actually have more conflict, not less. But the key thing is it's not personality conflict. It is, it is debate. It is dialogue. It is conflict around the important decisions that need to be made. And, and we find most teams live in a state of artificial harmony. That's where we're holding something back. We have thoughts. We have opinions. Um, but uh, we don't fully state, state those. And as a result, we have a hard time buying into the decision because we were all along thinking this isn't a great idea, but we didn't have the courage to speak up. And or there's a really important thought that the team needs to hear to make the best decision. But if we hold that back, uh, the team's never going to have that knowledge in order to make the decision. Interesting. The third behavior I comment that uh, when I was in academia, you know, I was a professor at um, Brunel University and I was teaching economics. And when I was attending American Economic Association conferences, and I was surprised that people were so critical uh, uh, at the point of they were tearing other people's work apart. But I remember I came with a paper on privatization and I was like bombarded, I was devastated. I thought I'm, you know, scholar from Eastern Europe, and, you know, and, and they, they torn me apart, but not me, but my work, which was really weak. And they then, Gennady, let's go for a drink. I couldn't believe it. I said, well, how come that you were so aggressive during my presentation and now you're inviting me for a drink? And they said, well, Gennady, but you is you and your work is different. We want to make it better. And for me, that was, that's what exactly the conflict is about. It was not about really personality. I would never forgive them. You know, I would never be, right. you know, sh shake hands with them. But when people are criticizing my work, it's fine if I am open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's about ideas, and it's about letting the best idea win, right. and it's about not taking, not making it personal, and then hopefully not taking it personal if we're it's, truly it's focused on it. As hard, a, yeah, sometimes hard, especially if we love the idea, if we yeah. associate ourselves with the idea, and if people are saying this idea is crap, <laughs> you feel that well, it's probably about you more than about the yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, and that's why trust is the foundation. What we find is. When teams have conflict or debate, but they don't have trust, mm -hmm. they get organizational politics. And that is, I don't trust you. I'm going to try to manipulate the situation. I'm going to try to get my way mm -hmm. versus when we have trust and then we have conflict, we get the pursuit of trust or the pursuit of truth or ultimately the best solution, best idea that we make as a team. I like this definition of uh, company politics, this Catherine, you know, in the book. She, she formulated oh, yeah. it very, very nicely. She said this politics is about like you pursuing, not because of the company you want to help company or the team, but you pursuing yeah. because you want to something to, 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 to look better or to, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in other people's eyes. So it's uh, something like that, but very, very, I think, correct. That's, that's yeah. really harmful. Yeah. The way we meet with teams, kind of the, the center of the bullseye of, of how do we minimize politics with an organization? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Is on a team, regardless of who I'm talking to on that team, if you and I are having a one-off conversation, if you, know, you and I and one other person are having a conversation, it doesn't matter who's in the room. We're talking about the subject the same way. We're not advocating or we're not leaving part of the message out. Um, we've all had instances 
where you and I are having a conversation, door opens unexpectedly, somebody walks into the meeting and everybody clams up because right. we don't want to keep talking about this subject. Or right. even if we keep talking about it, we just start talking about it differently than before. Like we, we, we know that somebody's listening, et cetera. So. Totally. And so we look at that and say, well, that's organizational politics. The goal, center of the bullseye, is same conversation had in the same way, regardless of who is in the room from the team. Is that, that's what we're shooting for. It's interesting. I have read somewhere that America is losing like $500 billion because of absenteeism, bad health, etc. So how much you know, uh, economy uh, is losing due to politics, corporate politics, and how oh. unhealthy it is. Because I worked in a couple of really big institutions, and yep. the politics is the game. And it's like you have to know the right people, you have to use the right words. You, I mean, opening yourself up is dangerous because you don't know who will stab you in the back. And That's I was right. working in the English culture, and it's very polite culture. And you feel, oh, people are so polite, then I can be more open. No, 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 no. I mean, people are polite, but yep. the policy and you know, organizational policies are so strong. And if you are not fit in, then you're out, no matter what qualities you have, what, how much creativity you have. And it's a terrible thing, which should be eliminated. But how? And you, uh, Patrick is showing how to do that. Yeah, that's right. It's through these behaviors, really, that, that we overcome the politics. So I'll touch quickly on the third behavior, and that's uh, called commitment. A lot of teams, um, as we meet with them, will say, hey, how's the commitment of this team? And they'll talk about we are committed to the organization. And when we talk about commitment, we're not talking about commitment to our jobs or commitment to the organization. We're really talking about commitment to decisions. Mm -hmm. And this takes us back because each of these behaviors build on one another. we got to have trust so that we can have healthy conflict. The reason that we've got to have healthy conflict is the principle of weigh-in to buy-in, weigh-in to buy-in. And basically what we mean by that is we've all had situations where somebody has made a decision in the organization that's going to greatly impact us personally or our area. Mm -hmm. And we all know if we were not consulted on that idea, it was just handed down, it's really hard to fully buy into that decision. But what we see in human nature is if we were part of that discussion, if we were part of that healthy conflict, even if the decision doesn't go our way, 99% of the people can actually fully buy into and support that decision. Mm -hmm. So a principle that we, we work with leadership teams on that we actually pulled from, from Intel, the chip maker, was they, they had a culture of, we have the ability to disagree and commit. Meaning we're not gonna agree on every decision, we're not always gonna get to a unanimous decision or, or consensus, but at the end of the day, we got to make a decision. When the leader says, I've heard all the, the, the data or all the input, we've got the data, here's the decision, that the team fully supports that decision as if it was their own. Isn't that the like military yeah. a little bit? Like in Said military, it. when there is a command and you, you have oh, yeah. to, you know, you have to, once you accept it, and then, you know, there is no way you can question it and not to, you know, right. to follow it. The difference would be, during in, in the military, oftentimes there's probably not as much debate first. Right. It's hey, the, the the military commander just hands down the edict and you gotta go. But the 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 similar similar piece would be once the decision is made, the expectation that everybody on the team fully activates it, implements it as if they're if as if it was their own decision. The opposite of this and what we see um, frequently in dysfunctional teams is is really two things. Number one is somebody just walks out of the meeting and they kind of nod along in the meeting and act like, fine, I'm going to do it. No intention to do it. I mean, they just go and do their own thing. The other, the other type, though, and it's probably even more frequent, we call it, uh, we call it alligator arming decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's where, as opposed to like fully put myself into implementing or activating that decision, I do just enough to be able to go back and tell the boss, yeah, I, I did it but we didn't fully own it. We didn't fully activate it and implement it. And what we know is the moment we don't fully own something, it's gonna fail. Boss brings everybody back in the room, says what happens. And then what's fascinating is so many times we get everybody's true thinking of, oh, I never thought it was a great idea in the first place. I thought we should have. And that's the, the behavior we gotta eliminate on teams. We gotta have the healthy conflict so that when we commit, everybody is fully committed to that decision. It brings me kind of a parallel to the work of uh, bureaucracy. When there is a new boss 
and everybody is paying lip service that yes, we are committed, we want you know to stay in our shoes, but actually they are they're not, and they do just a little bit just to stay in their positions and they kind of to give an impression that they are committed, but they are not, and that's why all the wonderful decisions are tor torpedoed, you know, because of that behavior, and this is really really important. I fully agree. Cannot agree with you more. Good. Um, so I'll touch on uh, fourth behavior. It, it, it's accountability, specifically peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So a lot of times people hear accountability and they think, okay, if I'm not the leader of the team, I can kind of relax on this one and backseat. Um, we believe the best teams, it's not just the leader that holds the team accountable. As a team member, we hold one another accountable to both behaviors, whatever behaviors we've agreed to as a team, mm -hmm. and also to decisions. And what we want to avoid is hub and spoke accountability. And that's where, hey, I got a problem with you. But as opposed to coming to you, I run to the boss and expect the boss to come to you. Yeah. I know when, when I was part of a team, um, I had the unique gift and ability at times to make decisions that would frustrate other people on the team. And I can very distinctly remember a couple of times where the boss came to me. And sometimes it was, hey, somebody has said this, wouldn't even say who. Other times they would you know, call out the person who had an issue and had a beef. And I remember every single time that happened thinking, man, if that person would have just come to me, it, it wasn't a big deal. Like I could have apologized. I could have made it right. I could have changed the decision. It, it really didn't need to be a big deal, but all of a sudden the boss is involved and it feels like a big deal. I've also been the boss in that set of circumstances. And while maybe it's not quite as frustrating, it's close of guys, why can't you just have a conversation and work it out? Mm -hmm. So that's where we go direct. And then, of course, the other kind of uh, unhealthy accountability is what we call triangulation. And so I got a problem with John, but as opposed to go to John, I go to you and we just talk about it, even though we're never going to actually have the conversation with John directly. It's the hardest behavior. So we have a team assessment. Over 50,000 teams have taken this. 80% wow. of teams score the lowest on accountability. Um, we just have a hard time having hard conversations with each other about behaviors or lack of follow through, that sort of thing. Mm. How interesting. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll quickly give the, the fifth and then we can go deeper wherever you'd like. The, the fifth behavior is a focus on results, specifically though, collective results. Every executive I work with would say, oh, yeah, I'm focused on results. But the question is who's and what results? Most executives are first focused on their personal results or their department or division, mm -hmm. not on the organization's results, uh, first and foremost. When I discovered Pat's teaching, when I discovered this principle, it rocked my world. At the time, this was before I was president of the company, I was leading the, the largest division. And whenever I would come to the leadership team, I saw my role and responsibility as I need to kind of fight for my people, my department, my division, make sure they have what they need to be successful. And I kind of justified it as, you know, as we do as a division, it really impacts the whole company. That's what you but think I, your, your, your ability, not your ability, your task as a leader was to protect. And in fact, you know, yeah. Simon Sinek, you know, this, it's called, you know, this uh, closed circle or uh, um, circle, safety circle or something. So, which is interesting because yes, I mean, you're protecting your department, but you're not actually contributing to the overall results. And that's what that's it right. is, really. Yeah. yeah. And so we teach this principle of team number one. Mm -hmm. Team number one is the team that you're on, more so than the team that you lead, needs to be your first team, where you need to have the greatest allegiance. Mm -hmm. And nobody teaches that. But someplace along the way, we all, we all intuitively think the team that I lead is my most important and we elevate that above the team that we're on. But when we do that, we get, not to get politi too political here, but we get like the United Nations where everybody's advocating for their country, their, their segment, more so than what's best for the collective good. And uh, as a result- I don't know whether it's a good example of, of effective uh, decision-making process. The United Nations for me is just really kind of, um, how can I say, even in this uh, coronavirus thing, I mean, they didn't do anything really. I mean, it's just- right. I'm Everybody's not. advocating for, for, for themselves, for, for yeah. their country versus what is best for the global good. Global. And, and here's, here's a question for, for leaders on leadership teams to ask themselves. If we're going to be focused on collective results, there are going to be times that we have to take a backseat on a decision. Mm 
-hmm. that if all we did was th think about ourselves personally, our department or division, mm -hmm. that we would say, man, that's not the decision that we would make. But the best teams, the moment that they realize, hey, even though it feels like a personal backseat, it is best for the collective good, they support it. Not only do they support it, they will offer up those things the moment they realize it. And, and the two areas that it's hardest for, for leaders to offer up, we find, no surprise here, is finances, so budget and people. I, I kind of use that as a litmus test as I work with teams, mm -hmm. is when I can see a leadership team begin to offer up both great people and parts of their budget to others on the team voluntarily, I'll know, man, this team is hitting it. This team is really understanding, focusing on collective results more so than just my personal results. Well, it's, it's, uh, I know that working uh, and organizational health is the most important. It's the, as Patrick said, it's com competitive advantage. It's probably one of the most important thing, you know, companies should be focused on. But at the same time, it's dealing with the people. It's, uh, it's a hard. It's the hardest thing ever, I think. It's much easier to make a nice, uh, you know, structure of the company, but, um, but to make alignment with the, with the people. I remember I was um, a consultant and I was kind of, uh, you know, I was a senior consultant in the Hay Group. I mean, I shouldn't probably mention that. And, and I managed to survive, I think, about seven months because my um, people were ladies. I, I, mean, I don't want to sound sexist, but there were so many, so, so many politics, and I didn't understand whether women's psychology, you know, et cetera. And when I was putting two ladies who were hating each other, one, you know, opposite another, and said, well, let's talk, like, you know, like men do. You know, let's talk, let's drink and talk maybe. And then uh, and it didn't work out. And, and I, I failed dramatically and I left. And people were saying, are you crazy? You had such a fantastic remuneration. You had this car yeah. and driver and, and the office. And, and I said, no, I am not happy. I'm, I cannot handle it. You know, I'm, I don't know what to do. And, and I've left. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, really important. But you mentioned as a trust, as the first one. Yeah. And trust means uh, vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, I think it varies from culture to culture because more much a culture. Well, for example, I, you know, I, my background is, uh, you know, you know, Russia, former Soviet Union, and there to be vulnerable, to admit your fault, you know, uh, um, my, my, my own mistake is is a tough. You know, a lot of people would prefer to die than uh, to, <laughs> to to admit publicly and then ask for help. Yeah. You know, much, yeah. much asking for help, no way. Yeah. And yeah. of course, it's changing with the new, you know, kind of generations. But still, it's such a difficult thing. It's easy yeah. to say, but it's so hard to implement. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I like to challenge teams on is, let's say we got a leadership team of five or six people. You know, it doesn't matter the number. But if we were able to get into the soundtrack of each person's mind, Mm -hmm. They have thoughts and opinions about every single person on, on the team that they're part of. Sure. And I know if someone would have ever come to me and asked me, hey, what are the weaknesses or what are the mistakes that your teammates have made? If I spent any amount of time working with them, I would never have had a hard time of coming up with that list of mistakes or weaknesses. I could go around the table and say, you know, lacks vision, struggles with follow through, late to meetings, poor communicator, you know, moody, whatever those things are. And what's fascinating to me is leaders, somehow we deceive ourselves into thinking, we know this about our teammates. We know hopefully their strengths as well, but we know their weaknesses and we know the mistakes that they've made. But we con ourselves into thinking like that as they look at us, we've got all of our stuff together and they don't see the weaknesses and see the mistakes. So how I challenge myself, how I challenge leaders is I think vulnerability is a lot about self-awareness and it's one is being aware of what are my weaknesses, where have I messed up and then the courage to simply admit it. But I find and I challenge teams very rarely are you going to inform your teammates of something they don't already know. Mm -hmm. You're just letting them that you know this about yourself. Nobody wants to follow a leader that's not self-aware. And so for me, who I, I wasn't raised in a vulnerable environment. I, I, this is like, I'm a work in progress as it comes to vulnerability. But one of the things that has helped me is this idea of self-awareness. And I'm not informing of them, them of something they don't already know. I'm just letting them know uh, I know this about myself.
Right. And it's interesting, when you really focus on the results, you, you're less concerned about your own ego. So if, if uh, you feel that there are some things maybe you don't understand or you don't know about yourself, so why not to ask people? Because if the uh, goal is really to achieve result, not to stroke your ego and to become, you know, like uh, everybody likable or whatever, then it's different. Uh, and it's different. I know that we, we try this six, uh, 360 assessment mm-hmm. tool many occasions. And uh, to be honest, it's very rarely worked. I mean, it's a wonderful tool. But people were so, um, how can I say, even anonymously, people were so, not afraid really, but uncomfortable to yeah. give true opinion about somewhere else. Unless you work with them like for a couple of hours, prepare them, explain that, please, for my own sake, I need that. I want to grow, you know, my open. I'm not going to have a, how do you call it, gradual on anybody. Uh, uh, and then they do it. But funny thing is, you still subconsciously, I remember, I still remember these people <laughs> who were critical about me. And I know that they were right. But it's still like it's something, you know, it's, it's, uh, maybe it's my psychology, which is such a distorted one. But, but I remember, I still, I still remember that, uh, that this negative thing, which I tried to avoid. I was grateful on one hand. On the other hand, I felt like, mm, yeah, somebody pointed on my weaknesses which I already know, of course, and, you know. Right. So this is kind of, again, it's, we're going into psychology, and that's kind of even the more <laughs> difficult thing. But basically, I, I fully agree that this trust, vulnerability, asking for help, this is the important, uh, you know, thing, crucially important. It's foundation. And if you don't have it, then other things um, really, you, you've got, you haven't got foundation to build your, your building, your, your organizational health on. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, t- can you tell me your own experience in this building trust? I mean, do you can you recall something which you're really proud of and uh, which you managed to create an organization uh, which was a lack of trust? Yeah. In, in terms of, uh, are you saying where uh, a team has had a significant lack of trust and built it uh, over time? You know, honestly, it's about. Gennady, it's about every team that have the privilege of working with. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things is we talk about teams and even relationships. The the moment that we put two people together, any relationship, there's automatically dysfunction. But, you know, in our consulting work, it's basic principles. But the way I like to describe our work is we help teams have conversations they're incapable of or unwilling to have on their own. And, um, Every team has what we call elephants in the room or elephants on that team of things that we just don't talk about because we know we don't agree and it's uncomfortable and awkward and so forth. And our work uh, with teams is actually to have those conversations. And what's amazing when we kind of call out the elephants and we put it on the table, the, the breakthroughs that can happen on teams and people who maybe hated each other, wouldn't even speak to one another. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden begin to understand each other better and the trust that can be built. Mm -hmm. Um, So a couple uh, examples of of how that trust is built is the the more we understand about each other's stories and background and the things that have shaped us. So we do an exercise called personal histories Mm -hmm. and three simple questions, but, but the, the, chance for people to be a little bit vulnerable is asking them, hey, what was a unique set of circumstances or a challenge that you faced as a child and how did it impact you then and how maybe it shapes you today? And um, man, I, some of the stuff that have come out from that simple question has been amazing where there was this, this hatred of one another, but the moment I understand that part of their story, all of a sudden I have some sympathy, I have some empathy for them to understand why they now react or why they behave mm-hmm. that way. Um, and another part of the work in building trust is around understanding just temperaments and personality profiles that, you know, um, the difference between extroverts or introverts or people with an intuition preference versus sensing preference. It's just hardwired and we're going to approach situations, decisions differently. And so we help teams understand both backgrounds, personalities, And through those two things, it's amazing the trust that can be built in a very short amount of time when we really slow down and focus on those things. 
Interesting, because this uh, misunderstanding, let's put it mildly, can last for years in the organization. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then uh, once, uh, it's like, you know, there's a famous story when uh, a gentleman is traveling in, um, by train in the compartment and opposite there is another gentleman with two, two kids. And these kids misbehave themselves. They really jump, they shout, they split. And, and the guy was sitting opposite and he was like suppressing himself. And then he said, why cannot you control your kids? You know, why? I mean, they behave like monkeys. And he said, their mother died two days ago. Yep. And all of a sudden, right? They can do whatever. They understand. Yep. So once really small thing, you know, a different angle, bang. And then you get completely different picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's fantastic I miss it you know I was working as a consultant for 15 years and uh, then I stopped doing that because it was too much traveling and I was flying one year I traveled 200 times can you imagine I was like Clooney thing I was like terrible I, mean, I can't I, imagine yeah and then, then but I miss it because I miss the heart you know one thing when you talk and you can talk and you feel like Milton Friedman to your audience another thing hands on Hear the real life situation, go and fix it. Yep. And it's not about your ego or about your money or about anything. It's about really helping the organization to survive. And sometimes yep. we're talking about a lot of lives involved. And, and uh, that's really important and very noble, I would say, work when it's done professionally and, and the yep. way you your company, your table group does it. So impressive. I know that you have to go, right? Is it, uh, or do we have uh, some minutes or? Uh, maybe, maybe another uh, question or two, but then I do unfortunately need to, to run here pretty quick. Right. Well, to be honest, I mean, I would really love, we'll see how response would be, you know, uh, after all this uh, uh, interview, but I would like to have you more maybe on our panel. And then, uh, because we're opening up, you know, big, big area of Russian speaking, you know, countries. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they're learning. I know that uh, Pat is offering something to East, Eastern Europe. I saw on his site, you know, that um, even them Slavonic names, you know, as a team, I think some Czech names. Mm -hmm. So, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the part of the world where, you know, former USSR, it's a really amazing field of uh, opportunities, really opportunities mm -hmm. and challenges, challenges. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I, I would like, again, the something which uh, we, we, I'd like just to mention, this organizational health. You know, which is another big book of of uh, of Pat, and uh, I think this again five uh, five uh, if I'm not mistaken five uh, areas of organizational health. So it's not dysfunctional, but organizational health as advantage, comparative advantage. Yeah. Um, so it's overall assessment of organization, and, and uh, not just team, but including you know the CEO behavior yeah. and management, etc. That's something you do as well, right? Your your team. Yeah. Uh, our primary focus is around uh, actually the four disciplines of organizational health. And we've really spent this um, session around that first discipline, building a cohesive leadership team. Mm -hmm. But quickly to touch on the other disciplines, everything else is about helping an organization create clarity. So the second, uh, second discipline is that, creating clarity around purpose and values and strategy and priorities. Um, and then once we have created that clarity, it's over communicating that clarity where everybody in the organization mm -hmm. is as clear as the team at the top. And right. we find that's the hardest discipline because when a leader's clear, they assume that everybody else is as clear as they are. So we've got to constantly communicate. That's why we call it over communicate. And then the last discipline is helping an organization uh, reinforce clarity. So it's looking at your systems, specifically your human systems, how you hire, how you onboard, how you do employee engagement, compensation, those kind of things and making sure that it is tied back to, to your clarity. So as a consulting firm, that's our focus, but it always goes back to, it always starts of, we got to have cohesive teams. If we can't have a cohesive team, and if we can't master those five behaviors, we'll never get to a point of truly agreeing on clarity in the organization. It's interesting because, you know, I worked a lot with Brian Tracy, and mm -hmm. Brian Tracy, one of his uh, key words is clarity, 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 clarity yep. in the organization. Yep. But really how to achieve it. And it's really how to make it from the, you know, floor sweeper lady to, to the, you know, yep. management team to see, oh, this clarity. And that would be fantastic. So people would work as a team, really. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. And uh, there is a new way of saying thank you. You know, instead of handshake, they say air of handshakes is gone now. 
So my 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 hand on my palm on my heart. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, really, hopefully, we'll see each other soon. So I will, you know, my my, my YouTube channel will develop further, and uh, I'll have more people. I, I, I'm, I, my plan is to have 500. I'm sorry, I love 50 uh, by this. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yep. 50 interviews by the end of the year, but 500 overall. So I have enough good people. Uh, I in, love it. Behind me, there is, you know, a hall of fame, and there are sure. many more. So I'd like to share the wisdom and touch different areas to help people to become better and the institutions to become better organizations. Hey, well, thanks for having me. It's been a delight. Thank you very much. Me too. Thank you very much, Dave. Bye-bye. See you again. Bye.